Well, good morning to our family and friends from the NASA North Lake. Can you believe it? This Sunday is January 30, 2022. This is the fifth Sunday in the new year. Time does not stand still. Um, our Sunday school lesson for this week is Heart Matters, with a subtitle of Jesus Transforms Us from the Inside Out. We will be looking at Jesus' teachings in Matthew 15, 1 through 20. Last week, we examined um, what it means to be called to share the good news of the gospel with others. By the end of today's lesson, we want to understand we are to seek the kind of purity of heart that honors God by mirroring, by mirroring the heart and life of Jesus in our world. In other words, reflecting his character in our lives. Now, a little insight um, into Pharisees. Now, when we hear the word Pharisees, we often think about priests and or teachers who taught the strict following of the law that God gave to Moses. It might be better to think of them as a denomination of the Jewish religion because most Pharisees were neither priests nor legal experts. They were just devout lay people who took seriously what they had learned from their teachers of the law. They believed that at Sinai, God uh, revealed to Moses both written and oral law. The oral law was interpreted by the teachers and passed down by word of mouth from a generation to generation. By Jesus' time, there was a whole body of uh, oral teachings that interpreted and applied the written law. The Pharisees considered the written law to be, um, the unwritten law to be as binding as the written Torah. Excuse me, I got a bit of a problem here. I got the uh, computers are lovely things, you know. Some days they don't work quite the way that we intended for them to do. Uh, let me see. Now I'm, my, <clears throat> my script is looking much better. It has a lot of holes in it just a minute ago here, so I had to reopen it. Okay. Um, if I can find where I was, we'll be all set here. The uh, oral law were teachings that uh, interpreted and applied to the written law. The Pharisee considered this unwritten law to be as binding as the written Torah. They made it their duty to learn, memorize, and faithfully pass on the oral law from previous generations to the next. Pharisees believed the oral law was uh, actually created a fence around the Torah. By observing these detailed traditions, the faithful would avoid violating more serious transgressions. Thus, for an example, women were forbidden to look in a mirror on the Sabbath day. Why? They might see a gray hair and be tempted to pluck it in violation of the Torah's explicit prohibit of harvesting on the Sabbath. Pharisees did not consider themselves meddling legalists or that the customary practices they encouraged to be burdensome or petty. They were genuinely concerned offering practical guidance as to how ordinary people could live holy lives in the real world. 
They felt their interpretation of the oral law made it possible to practice purity and adapt the ancient Mosaic law to their current situation in the first century of the first century Jews settled in the urban centers of Israel. After all, the Mosaic law was given more than a millennium ago, more than a thousand years earlier, and it was given to those recently freed Hebrew slaves who were wandering in the wilderness. So some interpretations seem to be called for. In our passage this week, a controversy arose when some Pharisees and teachers of the law from Jerusalem noticed that Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before they ate. The issue was not that some Galilean country bumpkins who were unacquainted with the city etiquette or inattentive to proper hygiene. The disciples did not act religious enough to suit the Pharisees. Now, connecting to my experience, I need to take a sip of water here. <clears throat> we are creatures of habit. There's no getting around that. We are formed and shaped by what we do. Our habits and rituals are interconnected with our character. So the first question is, what are some rituals that you perform on a daily basis? Well, as I think about this line of questioning, I had to wonder just what might be considered a ritual. Our lives, my wife and mine, have changed over the past few years. I have retired and uh, my wife's uh, mother has come to live with us. Mom is now 104 years old and is, tw and is still quite active, but sleep late and stays up late. This has changed my morning rituals. The following is my normal day, Monday through Friday. On Saturday, it is a little different because uh, before I start devotions, I videotaped a Sunday school lesson. That's what I'm doing right now. Sunday are also different as I get up and prepare breakfast for the family. Then we go to church and I do my devotions in the afternoon. But on a typical weekday, I wake up and do the necessary things, including getting casually dressed, and then start with a time of prayer. That includes praise to God for what he has done. This is followed by reading a daily devotion from each of seven different sources, both online and book form. I then uh, read a chapter from the Bible followed by reading several verses uh, on themes from an online source that includes verses from uh, each day, verses from Psalms, Proverbs, uh, verses from Jesus' teaching, verses from God's interaction, verses from the apostles' writings, verses uh, on blessing and prayer, and a couple of other themes. Excuse me. <clears throat> After that time of reading and meditation, I brew some tea and have breakfast. After that, the day uh, sort of just happens, except on for Mondays when I usually read the Sunday school uh, lesson for the next Sunday and start preparing the script for the videotaping on Saturday. So, are these rituals, the next question, are these rituals that you perform that uh, are specific to your faith practice? 
Well, you might think after listening to the above that most of my rituals have to do with practice in my faith. And you would probably be right. Um, what rituals do you perform because you are a Christian? Uh, this could be the same answers above. As I thought about this, I wanted to add a couple of thoughts. The rituals that we do as Christians have changed a lot since I was young. But some have not. Ladies uh, used to wear a new Easter bonnet, and they wanted a new Easter bonnet for Easter, right? And um, also the ladies um, would wear or would not wear certain fashions to church. Men always wore one of these, these ties here like this. And uh, to church, not necessarily this particular style, but anyway. Uh, and there was all kinds of different things that we did. Some things have not changed. And some of those are like most Christians, including myself, will bow our head and close our eyes when we pray. Our nativity sets for Christmas have wise men included. And we do celebrate certain religious holidays, such as Christmas and Easter, that are not designated in Scripture as days of celebration. They are a ritual that we have, tradition we have established. We do celebrate the Lord's Supper or communion, and that we are directed in Scripture to celebrate as often as we will. Now, some people celebrate it every Sunday, some every uh, first Sunday of the month, some every quarter. Uh, that varies so much. And I guess uh, God gave us the um, ability there when he said, do it as often as you will. But we do that in remembrance of Jesus. How can religious rituals be helpful or hurtful? in the life of faith. Whenever keeping a ritual or a tradition becomes more important than showing God's love and grace to someone, it has become hurtful to someone. A ritual should not be allowed to become a point of contention between believers. When a ritual leads us to understand, now a ritual can also lead us to understand some teachings and to worship from our heart, it is also helpful. Now I have no problem with, with a lot of rituals and a lot of, a lot of traditions, but there are, there are have in the past and there are still some that cause some problems for some people. Now our transition here. In today's passage, we will explore how human traditions became a point of contention between religious professionals and Jesus. Jesus wants us to understand the, what is truly most important for his disciples. because we are now his disciples if we're a Christian. Connecting to the word. We're going to read our first section here um, from um, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, you know, there is no Old Testament command requiring all persons to wash their hands before a meal. That's not in the Bible. Now, Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21, states that priests must wash their hands and feet before entering the tabernacle. Now, if you want to be generous, you can read this to allow that this allowed 
for the Pharisees, the possibility that the Pharisees and the teachers in this passage were trying to extend the concern of piety to everyone. In other words, if the priests have to do it on special occasions, then everyone should do it and do it every time they ate. Can you think of something in your own traditions that wasn't directly biblical, wasn't a direct biblical command, but rose to the level out of our concern for holiness? Well, as I mentioned above, our celebration of Christmas and Easter are not biblical commands. I do not know if the reason for celebrating them were to increase our holiness, but I believe if a Christian did not celebrate them, others would probably think they were not very holy. There is no biblical direction to bow our heads or to close your eyes while praying, but many expect that of uh, expect that of good holy people that they will do that. So are there possible dangers of extending our understanding of holiness unto others? Explain your response. Well, for me, the danger is that we may become judgmental and thereby hurtful. We may make people more concerned about accept, being accepted by adhering to so-called proper appearance instead of their relationship with God. As we noted last week, we cannot see the condition of another person's heart. Only God can. Our next piece of scripture here is um, chapter 15 of Matthew verses three through six. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what they might have been, what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father and mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. Now, in those first two verses that we read, Jesus' disciples are accused of sinning because they transgress the hand-washing tradition of the elders. Their tradition even defined how much water you need to use. In Jesus' day, the hand-washing ritual required sufficient water to cover at least the middle knuckles of the hand to be used. That you need that much water. Others, having more water than that was uh, considered a blessing. Now, Jesus did not argue with the Pharisees about hand washing. Instead, Jesus accused the Pharisees and teachers of sinning against an actual command of God. Jesus was particularly offended by a practice that allowed a person to declare their assets as koban, a gift dedicated to God. Now, they would use that as an excuse to avoid taking care of their parents in their time of need, thus not honoring their parents. These people placed their assets under a financial shelter. It made them look poor on paper, yet they maintained their wealth and they could use it for their own needs, however, they could say to their parents, I have dedicated all my money to God and I am unable to help you. 
It is, is it any wonder that Jesus cried out, you hypocrites? As is recorded in verse 7. You see, this was kind of that, uh, they were saying, I'm giving it, when I die, I'm giving everything to God. And so everything belongs to God now. And they could use it for their own good, but not, uh, they could use that fact to deny helping others. So why is it important to recognize the difference between a command of God, the written law, and a tradition, the oral law? What can happen when the lines between these get blurred? And what did Jesus say takes precedence? Well, I'm going to answer the last part of this question first. Jesus said the law of God takes precedence over the traditions of men. Now, in my opinion, the traditions of men are basically a human evaluation of what God would want. It may sound great, and it may be accepted by lots of people, and even by a Christian denomination but it is not equal to God's law. If a tradition allows you to do something prohibited by God's law, you need to follow God's law and not the tradition. Why does this matter concern Jesus? Why does Jesus have harsh words for these Pharisees and these teachers who are just trying to live a holy life? Excuse me, I need to get a drink here. Now remember, Jesus came and he said, I came to fulfill and or complete God's law, not to abolish it. Here we see the traditions of the Pharisees essentially abolishing the fifth commandment. Now, the fifth commandment is the first of the Ten Commandments dealing with human relationships. The first four deal with our relationship with God and the Sabbath, and the other six deal with our relationships with each other. The Pharisees and teachers were making their traditions equal in authority to God's law, making themselves almost equal with God and demanding that people needed to follow their thousands of traditions that they had put together in order to keep people from breaking the law of God. I'm going to read the next section here, Matthew 15, verses 7 and 9. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Well, verses 8 and 9 is a quote of Isaiah 29, verse 13. By quoting this, Jesus brought up the idea that there are discontinuity between the leader's lips and their hearts. In other words, their exterior actions did not align with their interior motivations. Question, what is Jesus trying to say about the relationship between our interior motivations and longings and our exterior actions. Is one more important than the other? Can one exist without the other? Explain your response. Well, it appears to me that Jesus is saying our interior motivations are to be based in our relationship with God. And they should match our actions, which people will see. Our actions and our words of our mouth do not save us. 
we are saved by our heart's relationship to God. God knows our heart condition even better than we do, regardless of our exterior motives and actions. I believe that long before our hearts, yeah, I believe that long before our, that, no, no, let me back up here. I believe that before long, our hearts motivations will reflect in our exterior actions. And that is whether they're good or they're bad. They will reflect exactly what's in our heart. How can we avoid creating and or following mere human rules within the church? I believe we need to be in God's word with the Holy Spirit as our teacher and guide. If we're familiar with God's law, the Holy Spirit will help us spot problem traditions that are in conflict with God's law. We also need to remember, it is not our job to judge. We are to show God's love and grace. Remember, Jesus boiled the law down to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love others as yourself. Our next section is Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 and 11. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Now, the Pharisees thought unwashed hands were defiled hands. And if you ate without washing them, it meant you were defiled. So how do Jesus' words help the crowd see what God truly desires? Well, the Pharisees thought what was on the outside matters. But Jesus points to the importance of being clean on the inside. It's really what's on the inside that matters to God. And it will show up on the outside. How do our words and actions reveal what is in our heart? Well, you know, to brush your teeth, you grab a tube of toothpaste and you start to squeeze some on your brush. And then you notice that instead of toothpaste, it's an antibiotic. Got the wrong tube. But do you continue to squeeze to get toothpaste? You know, after all, you thought it was toothpaste. Of course you don't. It is not possible to squeeze something out of the tube <laughs> that isn't in it. You know, life circumstances will squeeze words and actions out of you. Those words and actions will reveal what is really in your heart. Now we're going to read verses 12 through 14. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees are offended by when they heard this? He replied, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the pit. Now, the Pharisees believed that their traditions and the dietary laws would present them clean before God because of what they ate and what they refused to eat. Have you ever found it difficult to give up a system of legalism for a relationship based on trust? 
if so, when? As I read and reread this question, I did not have any answer. And I even had a hard time understanding why it was relevant. But I do have a thought about what Jesus was saying here. Last week, we talked about the soils and the seeds and how we were to sow everywhere as God prepared the soil and made the seeds grow. Here in verse 13, Jesus said that every plant that God has not planted will be pulled up by its roots. Here we see the Pharisees and the teachers planting and rooting their beliefs in their own traditions and actions instead of a relationship planted and growing in their hearts by God. As a result, they will be pulled out by their roots because they were blinded by their own interpretation of God's law. They were so blinded that uh, by their interpretation that they did not see God's love and grace. Now, you know, I've told uh, my Sunday school classes before that, you know, God did not write us out a list of do's and don'ts that we can check off. And that would be great if he did, because then every day we could take our list and we can check off, well, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, I didn't do that. And I did that one there that I was supposed to do, and here's a list I'm supposed to do, and I did do all those, and I didn't do all these I'm not supposed to do. And that would make it easy. But God's law was not based upon a whole list of do's and don'ts that we can check off. God's law was based on living his love, showing his love and grace that others might come to know him. We don't want to sin. There are things we're not supposed to do. But it isn't just a list like the Pharisees were making it. In what ways have you seen examples of the blind leading the blind outside of the church? What about inside the church? My first thought when reading this question was in the field of politics. You know, we see the blind leading the blind every day. And you know that no one is as blind as those who refuse to see. I have also seen fads in churches that started when someone claimed to have a new revelation from God, even though it conflicts with God's clear teachings in the Bible. It may sound good, and this may sound freeing, and it may come from a teacher who is very popular and very nice. But if it's not teaching God's word, it's the blind leading the blind. We need to trust God to lead. He is in control. And he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now we're going to lead the, read the last <clears throat> section of the scripture here. I'm going to take a sip of water first. Okay, we're going to read Matthew 15, 15 through 20. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked him. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth does, goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of the person's mouth comes from the heart. And these defile them, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eaten without, with, 
unwashed hands does not defile him. Now Peter, ever the, <clears throat> ever the outspoken disciple, asks for an explanation of Jesus' teachings. Why did they have such a difficult time understanding Jesus' clear teachings? What impediments stood in their way? To me, this is a very interesting and a little scary. <clears throat> we see that even the disciples are asking for clarification on what Jesus is teaching through this parable. And I don't know, is this really a parable? Uh, Jesus made a statement. We need to understand that the disciples had been raised with knowledge and probably following a lot of these traditions. They had been taught. They too were steeped in tradition. I said I, it was scary because <clears throat> we too are steeped in certain traditions of the church. Are some of them causing us to be blinded to the truth as revealed by God's law? Peter and the disciples are having a hard time to understand this teaching, which seems pretty plain. If you were one of the disciples who were there, because we are disciples, how would you have summarized Jesus' teachings here? What is his main point? I think Jesus' main point here is that our life is ruled by what is in our heart. And we must worship God from our heart. And if we do not, and if we do, our actions will be right if we worship God in our heart. And if we don't, uh, our heart, uh, we're not going to do what is right. We need to remember that we need to rule and worship God and love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. What is it that truly defiles a person? In verse 19, excuse me. In verse 19, Jesus provides a list of evil thoughts that come from the heart and out of the mouth to defile a person. The list includes murder, adultery, sexual immorality, uh, theft, false testimony, slander. Now, we should take notice that this list is actions associated with commandments 5 through 10 of the Ten Commandments. These are the commands centered in our relationship with others. Together, they were boiled down by Jesus as love others as you love yourself, which he said was the second great command after loving God. And as we look at these, all of these things that are listed are things that don't come from loving each other. When we don't show God's love, We are defiled. Why is it important for people to be transformed from the inside out rather than the vice versa? Well, for me, the only way to be tr to truly be transformed is to change what is in the heart. Because if the heart is not changed, the things that come out of the mouth will not be changed. To change the heart, 
takes a work of God's love and grace in our life. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and love God, the way to change your heart, if you want to change your heart, needs to start by accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because it can't be changed from the outside in. We need the Holy Spirit working in our life to change our hearts. Now connect into my life and the world. Jesus wants us to listen and understand his teachings. He has called us to not judge those who are not believers, but to love them and pray for them, even if they treat you wrong. He did tell us to be fruit inspectors for those who believe. Jesus wants to change us from the inside out so that our heart is made right with God and that we can be his child. We need to be careful of rituals, traditions, and rules that are man-made and not based on biblical commands. Some may be good and not cause a problem. But we cannot depend on following traditions to make us holy because that is from the outside. And what is from the outside does not make us holy or save us. It is what comes from our heart, from the inside, that will either save us or make us holy or will defile us and blind us to God's truth. Now, I'm going to read you the questions from this uh, section of connecting with our world. And I'm going to read these for each of us to think about from our own life experiences. Because we all have a different experiences here. And um, I'm not going to uh, expound on the answers here that could be given. So, first off, what are examples of when a community of faith has generally embraced more external matters or internal matters? What are some examples? of when a community of faith has generally embraced more external matters or internal matters. How have you seen this played out? How does that impact people's journeys of faith? Think about that in your own experience. Excuse me. Uh, I'm going to itch up here on my head. Okay, next thing to think about. Is it wrong to think that holiness or concerns for holiness should lay claim to how we behave? Why or why not? According to Jesus' teachings, what we witness here, teachings that we witnessed here, where might the concern go off track. Should we want to be holy? Should we be concerned about being holy? Why or why not? And can that concern take a, take a wrong turn, huh? Okay, have you witnessed groups of people, the crowd, say, here, marginalized from the church as a result of unrealistic holiness demands from those in the church? Have you ever found yourself focusing on external signs of holiness and purity? And has that damaged any relationships that you had?
And the final question here is, how does Jesus' teaching serve as a necessary corrective for us today? You know, we should remember that most, if not all, of Christian traditions are rules that were developed as boundaries. Now, the purpose of a boundary is protection. We put up boundaries, you know, to keep things where they belong and protect us. Any rule should be evaluated based on God's word and its relationship to live in a holy life. On the other hand, when the emphasis is on keeping the rules and not on holy living, even good rules can become empty traditions. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and you call us to be a holy people to follow your laws. And you call us to love you and to love each other. And as some people have said some days, it's some people are hard to love. But you know, Lord, with your help and the Holy Spirit in our life, we can carry out your uh, commands and love each other and pray for those that are hard to love and uh, pray that you would help us to know how to love them and to uh, understand <clears throat> understand them and their problems and concerns. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to uh, be filled with your spirit and to uh, become the kind of people that uh, are serving you and are a light to others and who show your love and grace to many. We also pray, Lord, for uh, uh, those in our church who have um, health issues and uh, we think of uh, Ms. Consuela, who hasn't been back with us for a while, and we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to touch her body and help her. We pray for Jay and, and uh, Debbie taking care of him. And uh, we think of um, Alonzo, Alonzo Smith, who is um, has cancer and um, is um, going through a hard time with it right at the present. We pray for others around who experience things with COVID and all of these. And we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, reach out and touch many there. We think of those in in uh, Africa, where they, Liberia, where they had uh, people trampled to death in the, at a uh, revival meeting because of um, other group causing problems and we just pray lord that you would just uh, help people to um, come to find you and to love one another and to uh, be with um, your spirit in their heart in a special way this week thank you for being with us thank you for your teachings in jesus name amen well that's it for today my camera isn't working quite right, and I hope this thing went out the way it should. It says my stream is good. So, uh, and remember, God loves you, and uh, so do I. Have a good week.